Well, it's great to see everyone here this morning. Some of you will remember, well, most should remember this. Maybe some children who are a little too young can't remember this, but especially the kids. You guys will have remembered maybe, I don't know, 2018, 2019, and then we lost it in 2020, Legoland. How many of you remember Legoland out near, out near the market out there? A few, okay, all right. If you didn't, if you've never been to Legoland, all right, as a kid, I, we would take our kids there a couple times a year and we went to the market and we went up to Legoland and, and you go in and they have these big display pieces and they say don't touch. There's like a giant Batman or a dinosaur or something. It took so many Lego bricks to build those, I'm sure. And every now and then you'd see kids sitting on the dinosaur for a picture and, and big do not touch sign there. And then they would have a little store. And the store had incredible prices. <laughs> I'll let you determine what incredible means there. De determine, uh, you can understand that from the price of Legos. But in between the display pieces in the store, there was like a playground. You know, it wasn't a playground, but there was like bins of Lego and they had like a uh, little... Um, uh, little slides, you could build cars and have races, and they just, you just go in there and you just let your kids go and then go have fun, you say don't touch the big displays, go and have fun. And so kids would run in there, they loved it, they build things and then they come out and say, well I built this, and the idea I'm sure is that you, your kids enjoyed so much they want to go into the store and buy the Legos they were playing with, I'm sure that was the, the, the idea. Now, some kids, as they're in there, they probably got the idea that a lot of retail stores are like Legoland. Now, I, I figure this because I worked years ago, I worked at Toys R Us. And when I was working at Toys R Us, many of the children there, not many, a few of the children there, they acted like Toys R Us was Legoland, like this retail store was Legoland. They'd be riding around, no word of a lie, I'd see kids riding up and down the aisles on bikes and tricycles. I remember one kid, he was kind of going past the family, bumped into a lady and kids in carts, someone pushing them and three of them in the cart and they're going through the aisles. And we, as, as workers, as employee, employees there, we'd say, where are the parents? And some of those kids, you'd know, you'd see them coming. Say, look, there's those two kids coming again, those little brats. Now, it wasn't their fault. It wasn't their fault. Their parents were supposed to be helping them. Their parents were supposed to be overseeing what they were doing there in the store. Some of them would open packages of toys to play with them. And you're like... The parents not going to pay for that? I was shocked sometimes at a few of them, not many, a few, and what little discipline they were getting or, or instruction oversight from their parents. Now, it's a parent's responsibility to raise up your children so that they will turn out to be uh, likable, so they will turn out to be respectable, so they will turn out to be uh, mature, respectable adults who respect Others belonging, things that don't belong to them and appreciate them. They'll be likable. People will want to hire them. People will want to be around them. That's what parents do. You don't want your children growing up and ending up in prison or having a difficult life, job to job. No one wants to hire them. They can't afford food because you did a bad job in parenting them. Now, I'm not saying that because there's few parents out here that I'm preaching the sermon to. I never preach a sermon based on individuals. I'm saying that because as we come to the text this morning, as we've been looking through the, the, the passages in 1 Timothy and, and, and to Titus, we're talking about oversight over the church. God has designed parents to oversee their children. God has designed structure in families, structure in society, and structure in the church. In society, we have laws and the government's there for a reason. And Paul writes about that, and this is from God. And in homes, we have parents, and children are to obey their parents. There is a structure, and God has this in the church as well. Now, we might think, you know, oh, well, we don't need it. It's not important. That's a part of God's design. Do you know that Jesus, listen, if anyone didn't need parental supervision at the age of 12, as for a 12-year-old, it was what we see from Jesus. And I want you to take a look. I think I've got this passage here. No, I didn't put it up there. You can take a look in your Bibles. Luke chapter 2. Every year his parents went to the, they traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Jesus was 12. And they're on their way home. And they're like, where's Jesus? Is he, he must be with the aunts and uncles. Is he, no, 
they went back and they searched for Jesus for three days. And when they found him, they, they said, when his parents saw him, verse 48 of Luke 2, they were astonished, uh, sorry, uh, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Can you imagine how Mary and Joseph would have felt? I mean, you know, 12 years later, but still you understand this is a very special child. You know, God's only son and he's in your care and you just lost him. And it's been three days and you're searching for him. And you're like, oh man. And, and by the way, you'd be like, okay, you gave him to us. Please help us find him. You don't think they were praying that God would help them find their son? They were praying, I'm sure. And when they found them, they're like, what's your problem? Like, don't you know? I would be so mad if my 12-year-old... Now, put that thing about Jesus. Where was he for three days? How was he surviving? I mean, he would just sit there, no food, no water. I mean, he, he, was, he, was, he was in his father's house, he said, and they were, they couldn't, the teachers couldn't believe his wisdom. I mean, he was a bright young man, especially at that day and age when, you know, you grew up a lot quicker than you do today. So if anyone would have been okay, it would have been Jesus. But this is what we read in the text next. They go back to Nazareth and um, he was obedient to them. From then on, he, you know, he obeyed his parents. You know, he, he made sure that he was respectful and obedient to his parents. That's the idea of that next verse. So Jesus was under the authority of his parents and he respected that, even though he probably didn't have to around that age. So God puts parameters with a, a structure with parents in society and God does it in the church. We have structure in the church and a lot of people they are like, oh, well, we don't need the church. Church isn't important. We've seen problems. Problems with the structure. Listen, when you see those bratty kids coming, you know, God doesn't want the world seeing his bratty kids there with no oversight. Because that's the implication that I'm trying to make here is, you know, there's us in the world, and God wants his family to be attractive to show that he's a good parent, that he's a good father, that he gives us, he, he's, he's raised us up and matured us and helped us to go into the world to be a help to society, to be a light, to be um, one in individuals that represent him well. And so, if that's what God wants and God tells us, listen, this is how I'm going to mature you. This is how I'm going to help you. And one of the ways he does that is he gives oversight in the church. So if you say, I'm going to be a Christian and a child of God and a follower, but I don't need the church, you're missing some of God's instruction. Paul writes that the church structure is a gift. He gave himself some to be a Apostles and prophets, pastors and teachers. There's that word, pastors and teachers, elders, bishops, overseers. Why? To equip us and to build up the body of Christ. Okay, so it's a gift. It's a good thing. It's an official position. As Paul writes his letter to the Philippian church, he says to the saints, the Christians in the church, they're the holy ones, that's what saints means, who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, these two special positions that are amongst the Christians in the church in Philippi and in other churches. And we know that because he goes on to give qualifications. Now this word, um, the, the words that are used for this um, role, category, uh, this office, this is another word that's used, this calling of an elder, there's a number of words that are used in Scripture. And these words are used to describe it. Now, here's a chart I found online. Uh, the colors don't show up that well due to the projector, but that's okay. You get the idea. So there's you know, um, some overlap between these three. So there's three different, um, you're looking at three different circles here. There's a blue one that kind of goes this direction here. And then you've got a pink one and a green one. Pink one and a green one's at the bottom. I don't know if you can see that green. Anyways, all three of those, they overlap with some passages. There are three words that are used. Presbyteros, elder, and pastor, poimen, shepherd, pastor. And overseer, episkopos, bishop, overseer. And those words are used interchangeably. The most famously, Peter talks about, uses all three of them to describe the same 
category or role or office. I'll refer to it as an office most of the time. And these are descriptive words, okay? So you've got shepherding, overseeing, caring for the flock and shepherding, and maturing, elder with wisdom. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at this role through the letter that Paul wrote to Titus. And today we're going to look at this role through the letter Paul wrote to, Tim writes to, wrote to Timothy. Now I will say this. It's a difficult thing when we get to elders and deacons. We spent the whole class this morning talking about one little, we didn't get to the qualifications, uh, talking about one little section of, of deacons. And, you know, not, elders is even more, uh, even a bigger topic. So it's not easy. And sometimes we're trying to figure out the text. Remember that Paul, Timothy, and Titus, who he's writing to about the elders, they would have had a good grasp on what Paul is saying because they, they were with Paul through much of his ministry. Paul writes them and calls them his sons. So they would have totally understand this a lot more than maybe than we're trying to wrestle with it years later. But here's a couple of things that a review from last week. So from last week, we learned elders implies older. Okay, we talked about in the Old Testament, the elders of Israel. It's a tough role. They're going to be judged more strictly. They must give an account. But it's a blessed role. They'll receive a crown of glory, and it's a role that we are to desire. We talked about um, not everyone's going to be chosen. It's not a role for everyone. And if you feel you should be an elder and you're not chosen, and, you know, we can't get mad at that. If you get mad at that and you're like, well, I'm not, forget it, I'm not going to work with the church, in a, then you shouldn't have been an elder anyways, in my opinion. The flock needs to cooperate. There's many individuals who would have, being good shepherds or overseers that maybe didn't fit these qualifications. Paul might have been one of them who would never have been an elder of a church. Is he still a good shepherd? Is he still a good leader? Yes, but not particularly in that role would he have been qualified. The flock needs to cooperate. You know, if you ever try and help an animal out that doesn't cooperate, I, I've seen these videos online of a, a wolf stepping in a trap and they didn't want to trap the wolf or a big cat. And they got to get the, the, the trap, you know, the paw out of the trap. Well, have you ever seen how they do that? Because if they just go up there and say, oh, they try and pet it, I'll help you. They're going to get attacked. And so, no, they get this big, you know, sometimes a big metal sheet with a little hole in the bottom. And they walk up so that the animal can't see them. And they put it down. And then they can work on just the foot. So it protects them and it keeps them away. So we don't want to be like those wolves and cats that are like trying to attack the ones that are helping us. And that's a principle we're going to look at a little bit later. There's a verse that talks about this. So we're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 3. Last week we talked about um, Paul's letter to Titus. And there he gives some qualifications. And he tells Titus to appoint elders in every town. And then he says this is what elders are to be like. Today we're looking at the letter that Paul writes to Timothy. And to Timothy, here's what he says. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble task, a noble work. An overseer must be above reproach, husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his own household competently and have children under his control with all dignity. And then he explains this. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert or he may become conceited and incur on the same condemnation as the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. The devil has talked about here a few times this is not an easy task. A little bit scary, really. You're, you're dealing with, you know, fighting against the evil one. Now, if we're to look at these qualifications, I want to talk a little bit about these because we're in the middle of our elder deacon selection, our elder deacon review. We normally do this every three years. We've missed a couple, and so it's been a long time in coming. Although we do know these things shouldn't be taken lightly and, and shouldn't be done in haste. Um, and there's a verse that we'll look at. Some of these qualifications are not easy. So I found a chart online. If you, uh, this is really good. It, it, you know, here's the, for deacons, the qualifications, and then Titus and Timothy, 
and they're kind of lined up by the arrows, which ones are the same, which ones are a little different. Some of these qualifications seem pretty, you know, pretty easy, pretty, you know, it's like no-brainers. I mean, you know, uh, not a drunkard, not violent. I'm like, yeah, okay, that, you know, do, do you have to write that? You know, I mean, could you just say they have to be strong, faithful Christians? Well, obviously, Paul wants to give some details in what he's looking at. Not pursuing dishonest gain, hospitable, loving what is good, self-control, upright, holy discipline. Now, some of them seem very simple, straightforward. Others seem a little bit challenging. The husband of one wife literally means, you know, a, a one-woman man. Does that mean that, you know, he should be married? Or does that mean, like, what happens if someone's, you know, their spouse passes away? Do they immediately have to step down? Or does that just mean they have to be faithful to their wife? Okay, so some of these are a little bit challenging in what we're trying to do. What about with believing children, um, having children that believe? Well, does that mean that, you know, children that believe when they're living at home? What happens if you have an elder, they have believing children, and then that elder passes away and their children stop believing. Does that mean they should never have been an elder? Okay, so again, there's some challenges with, with this when you, you, know, you think about it. And what about believing children? What if it's not even the elders? What if it's not because of that man that the children believe? I mean, think about it. Titus, or Timothy, you know, Paul writes to him, he says, you know, your faith which came through your grandmother and your mother. You know, it, and his father was a Greek. It seemed to have nothing to do with his father. What if his father became a Christian and the church is like, you got an awesome son and you're doing pretty good, you're going to be an elder. Does that mean that was, he did a good job with his kids? Or does that mean that maybe it was his spouse that did a good job and, and he's just qualified for, you know, just because he seems to fit some of these. So these are not easy for us to figure out. Some of them seem straightforward. Some of them we got to spend a little more time. Others, we can... We can get so specific, we could disqualify any, everyone. A, a rep, good reputation with outsiders. Well, I, I heard uh, one of the elders, or let's say someone was going to you know, pick someone, and someone said, you know what, I don't think they should be an elder because they don't have a good reputation with outsiders. I heard them getting angry at an Amazon rep on the phone, and that Amazon rep doesn't like them, so they should not be an elder. I mean, seriously. We could find any little details to disqualify anyone. I could find anyone as another and find a way to fit it in here and make sure they're disqualified. So we have to say, well, listen, no one, let's not do this. No elders, no deacons. Let's just everybody serve and do the best we can. But then we're missing out on the great blessing God has for us. And we're also not following God's design. So we don't need parents. We're just going to go without supervision and, and, and shepherd ourselves. So you don't force eldership, but you also don't neglect it. So again, not easy. People have spent a lot of time wrestling through this. And I want to spend a little bit of time this morning. So it's a challenging subject. Um, and I'll mention as well right here, there is no detailed process in Scripture. It doesn't say, here is how you appoint elders. It'd be great if it did. Bang, 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 done. And there's people who will point to certain passages and say, well, this is how it was done here. This is how it was done this way. They might have been elders. That's how they did it. So, I mean, so again, we're faced with a real challenge. God designed it. God wants it. But God doesn't give us all the little nitty-gritty details and everything. So a lot of this, too, we have to be gracious, patience. We're going to maybe disagree with one another on some points. But let us not, let this not be a, a point to divide the church. Let it be a point where we can work together to build the body of Christ. If we get something wrong, that's why we do our process every few years. We study these things and we grow together and we're, we want to follow the truth, so we're open for it. If someone says, hey, why do you do it this way? And you missed this, you misinterpreted this, we'll sit down and study. It might take a little bit of time, but that's the idea is that we're trying to do things in a way that's truthful and honorable to the Lord. So one of the big subjects that, that comes up in our society today, and I'm going to touch on it quickly, is roles. Last week we got into this. Why does it have to be men? Is there ever, ever women elders in churches? We're not going to talk too much about it because it's a whole other subject. But I will say this. 
when we're dealing with this subject, first of all, there's some arguments that are out there, and I mentioned that we talked about this a little bit in class. For example, you know, just because someone meets in someone's home, some people say, well, they're meeting in Lydia's home, she must be an overseer of the church because it's her home. And there are some, there's debatable and disputable issues in Scripture. Some people say, you know, when someone carries a letter, they have to teach it. And they're the ones, so if, if it was ever carried, there are some debatable and some arguments that you might agree with, you might find are foolish. Here's where I stand. I'm going to say this is me personally, and I know others might not agree, and that's okay. Personally, I want to stand before God and say, God, and I, we all do, I did the best I could. I, we really tried. But where we are right now, we haven't had elders in a number of years of review. So we're trying to get there. And here's what we know when it comes to, um, when it comes to this passage of Scripture. The husband of one wife. He talks about husband, man. There are a lot of challenges when it comes to wording. Elder can mean older. Elder can mean a specific role. Deacon can mean servant. Deacon can mean specific role. Apostle can mean one sent with a message. It can mean the 12. It could just mean a general Christian. Disciple can mean the 12. Disciple can mean general Christian. There are words when you translate, we talked about this morning, there's no word for husband and wife. It's just man and woman. So you have to try and understand based on the context. Are we all apostles sent with a message into the world? Yes. Are we all the 12 apostles? No. So when you're reading a passage, you have to decide, is he talking about the 12, or is this for everyone? When he says, you won't have, Jesus sends his, his disciples out, says, don't worry about what you'll say. It'll be given to you. Is that just the 12, or does that mean all of us, and that's now all of us? I don't have to prepare my sermon. God's going God's to gonna just tell me what to preach this morning. Some people do that in life. And so that's our challenge. Now, what I do know when you go back, I know there are roles. God has structure. God has roles. He has designed, and our culture, there will be some that will disagree with me. God has designed us and given us gender, male and female. Now, again, you don't take the exception to the rule and base that for making the rule. There will be some exceptions. We're all made a little bit differently. But generally speaking, male and female, God has made them. There are different roles in their life. And there are roles God gave through history. Why did God make Adam first? Why did God make it so that the promise goes through the men? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the promise goes through the men. Why? Why were the priests only men? Why are the majority of the prophets only men? Why is it that when angels came in the form of a human, it was never a woman, it was a man? And why is it when it comes to miracles, that aside from prophecy, that were men were the only ones doing the physical miracles? I mean, there was a lot of challenges. Like, why? I, I don't have the answers to all these things. I just look back and I know that's the way it was. Why did Jesus come as a man? Why did Jesus chose 12 men? He could have changed it up big time. I mean, they changed the, the Gentiles. You know, Gentiles weren't included. And they in the New Testament, it's abundantly clear that the Gentiles are now to be accepted. Now, that being said, people can look at that, and they have, and they've abused roles. Because Jesus comes, and Jesus highlights the importance of both. You see, you don't have to be equal to have this. I mean, you, having value doesn't mean equality. From two weeks ago, Father, Son, and Spirit, different roles, they're all equal. Father's not more important than the Son. They have different roles. And so when it comes to men and women, we have different roles. So for women, the promise went through the men, but it also came through the women. I mean, Ruth and Mary, Jesus came through women. Even though he came as a man, if it wasn't for women, there'd be no men. So God designed us to complement one another. And that's where you get these words complementarian and egalitarian, this argument that comes in. So the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection were women. Jesus treated women differently than most people in that culture and society. So much so, people were shocked. Oh, you're talking to a woman? Lord. He sent the woman at the well as the first messenger into Samaria. Jesus taught Martha and Mary, let them sit at his feet. He taught them. 
Jesus was supported by the women. And the early church had amazing leadership from the women. You see Lydia and inviting the church to meet in her home. Priscilla and Aquila, it seems like Priscilla was the one there that was really on fire. And, and I mean, not that Aquila wasn't, but Priscilla's name is mentioned first a few times, which implies, you know, maybe she had a, a special role. There were certainly women who were called to attention in the New Testament. But does that mean that there's, there's now no roles? So all I'm saying is when we come back to this passage of Scripture on elders, it seems like the elders, seems to me, that the elders were men. In the Old Testament they were men. The Sanhedrin were men. Paul writes and talks about men. And so through our process, we're looking at that qualification saying, okay, we're going to choose men as the elders. It doesn't mean better. And by the way, married, maybe God's saying here, when it talk about the one woman wife, are they, or maybe it, their wives need to still be alive in order to complement their role. Because we know the two are one. And anyone who sees elders in action, I'll tell you right now, even though I'm up here and I'm preaching and teaching and you might say, well, here's a man that's doing it. My wife is a huge influence on my life. And if you don't think that some of my teaching is influenced by my, my wife, then you have a lot to learn about marriage. There is a lot that we learn from each other. We shape each other. It was that old joke, you know. The man might be the head, but the woman is the neck that turns the head. Now we are, the two become one. And so when you think about this role, you realize it is a role that is complemented by both. But by and large, the men are the ones that are called out. Again, why? Maybe God has his reasons that we don't know. For some of these things that you disagree with, not just on the gender, there are many things you might disagree with. Maybe God has his reasons. Do you remember that old, I, I, I should have brought it today. I had a, a comic strip I found, it's one of my favorite ones. It shows a bunch of people carrying their crosses. And they're walking with their cross. And the one guy stops and says, Lord, this cross is too heavy for me to bear. Please lighten it for me. And he sees a saw and he's like, oh, thank you, Lord. And he cuts his cross a little lighter. And he keeps walking and all these people are walking together, bearing their cross. And he's like, Lord, I'm still, it's too heavy. Please. And he has a saw and he cuts it even shorter. And finally, he's got this tiny little cross and it shows everyone carrying their crosses, walking on the road of life, sweating. And this guy's taking it easy and he's smiling, walking. He's at the head of the pack. He's got the latest cross. And all of a sudden, they come to this big chasm, this, this big canyon. And he stops and he's like, oh, man, how are we going to get across? And all these people with their crosses and, oh, hey. They throw their cross down and they walk across their cross and they pick it up and keep going. But this guy cut it so short, he couldn't get across the canyon. And so that illustrates that maybe there are reasons for the way God designs things that we don't fully understand. So we do our best and we just trust God. And so with a lot of these qualifications, I don't have all the answers. And there are people who have debated this for a long time. The answers, I think, and as we pray about, we're just doing the best we can based on the information we have. But here's what we do know. We need to trust God. We need to be slow in not appointing elders too quickly. You know, that's what Paul writes to Timothy at the end of this. Don't be too quick to appoint anyone as an elder. You know, it's not just a matter of, oh, oh yeah, we need them. Okay, yeah, let's see. Boom, boom, boom. Let's do it. That's not how this goes. This takes a lot of prayer. This is a serious work, but it is a blessed work. And if you remember from two weeks ago, the elders of Israel who were taken up and they got to go up that mountain and eat with God and see things no one else saw. And we remember that God's hand is at work. It's the Holy Spirit who appoints them. Just like in marriage, you know, in marriage, Jesus talks about marriage and God and Jesus said, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Whenever I do a marriage, I make sure people know, hey, I can say whatever I want. The government can say whatever they want. That piece of paper doesn't bind you. It's your promise before God, and it's God that's doing some kind of binding. God is doing the anointing. We do our best, and it's God who anoints. And finally, it's a great responsibility and a great blessing. This is God's flock. We are God's sheep. 
And the elders will receive a crown of glory when the chief shepherd appears, but this is something not to be taken lightly. You don't take the sheep of Jesus, the family of God, lightly. And so when Peter is reinstated by Jesus, Peter is told by Jesus three times, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter went on in life. He writes this letter. He is a changed man from that fisherman who was wild and walked on the water and just was the first one to run into trouble, it seems. Here he is, a wise old elder who's changed and who is writing to other elders as a fellow elder to shepherd God's flock. And there's a lot of challenges that come with that. One of the biggest ones is, is patience. I have a quick video. It's embedded. I don't know if, uh, if you can play. You don't need the sound. If we have sound, great, but let's see if it'll play. Uh, to the left. Okay, some of you may have seen that before, right? It's gone around the internet, maybe you haven't seen it. What a great illustration. We are sheep, and we need help. And we're going to make mistakes over and over and over, just like that with sheep, just like a couple weeks ago, I talked about sheep going over the cliff, and all the sheep following. We do a lot of things, we make a lot of mistakes, we do a lot of things wrong, and the elders are there to guide us, to protect us. Someone said the elders should be peacemakers, prayer warriors, teachers, leaders, decision makers, examples, listeners, and um, protectors. Not an easy task, but one that God calls us to have, calls us to be willing to fill, and one that we should not make it a burden. Final passage we'll end with. Obey your leaders, submit to them, since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give it account, so that they can do this with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. God's design in this church is for our blessing. We need to trust God and watch what God will do when we follow his lead. Let's stand as we sing our final hymn.